proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story. As proudly we hail Major Charles E. Yeager, United States Air Force. Flight Through Sound, the story of the ever-growing pioneer spirit of our United States Air Force, the story of the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first, young man, take your place in the new jet age as an Air Force aviation cadet. You'll get 18 months of intensive training, learn all about jet operation, and you'll be surprised how easy jets are to fly and how safe, too. Aviation cadets graduate as Air Force lieutenants with earnings of over $5,000 a year. To qualify, you must be between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single, and have at least two years of college. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station for details. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hailed production, Flight Through Sound. <laughs> Chuck Yeager. Name mean anything to you? It should. Chuck Yeager and the X-1, the first man on the first plane to fly through the dreaded shock waves that come at the speed of sound and live to tell the tale. Chuck Yeager and the X-1 will both go down in history because their flight through sound was, well, historic. At the time Chuck Yeager made his flight, it was widely believed that when an aircraft reached the speed of sound, it would disintegrate. And there was none to say it wouldn't. Many planes had disintegrated in midair when coming close to the sonic wall. Many a good man, too many, had lost his life because his plane got out of control when it approached the speed of sound. None had reached or surpassed the speed of sound and returned to talk about it. Three men are talking in a bare room at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the Air Force's giant research and testing field outside of Dayton, Ohio. The season is midsummer and hot. The year 1947. The men are Colonel Albert Boyd, commanding officer of Edwards Air Force Base at Muroc Lake, California, Captain Jack Ridley, flight test engineer, and Captain Charles E. Yeager, a pilot. Captain Yeager has obviously just been called into the conference. There's an air of informality in the room. Colonel Boyd is talking. Well, that's the way it is, Jaeger. Now, you're not being ordered to do anything. We just want to explain the problem to you. I'll be the flight test engineer, Chuck, and I think I can explain to you what you might want to know. But you have to know what this is all about before you can answer. Well, maybe I can cut this short and make it easier for you. You've got a new project for me. You want me to take Bell Aircraft's new X-1 up and test it? Right. But it isn't a normal testing job. The X-1 isn't really a plane, it's a flying laboratory. Now, it was built for one purpose, to see if man can fly a plane faster than the speed of sound. Well, I sort of guessed that. Bell had a pilot, a good man. He had tested the X-1, he took it up about Mach point eight, and then he backed out. Maybe he wasn't as curious as I am. So they give the X-1 to another pilot. Now, he went through the same performance. He was willing to test any plane, but he wasn't going to try to fly through the sound barrier for any amount of money. I want you to know all this. I, I don't think any less of those men. If the plane can do it, someone's going to try. Why not me? As much as a person can know about anything that's never been done, I know that that plane can fly through the sound barrier. What'll happen then, we don't know. Where do we go? Uh, Edwards Air Force Base, Muroc Lake, California. Uh, we'll do a lot of talking about this, though, before we start.
Colonel Boyd, excuse me, my name is Kenneth Banghart. I've been listening, and I've got some questions. There are some things I don't understand. Maybe you could help me. Well, I can guess a few. What is Mark? Mm -hmm. How fast is sound, right? That's right. Well, the speed of sound varies with the temperature and the density of the air. Now, roughly at sea level, at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the speed of sound is about 760 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. Now, the temperature gets lower, so does the speed of sound, as you go higher. Now, at about 35,000 feet, the temperature levels off to minus 67 degrees. That's 67 below zero. Uh -huh. And it stays that way up to over 100,000 feet. And all through that, the speed of sound is constant at 662 miles an hour. So the speed of sound varies between 660 and 760 miles an hour. That's, mm. that's about a mile every five seconds. Well, that doesn't seem so fast, about 12 miles a minute. Huh? Hey, wait. That's not 12 miles an hour. That's 12 miles a minute. Right. Wow. And now for a mark. That's the speed of sound. Instead of calibrating instruments for high speeds in miles per hour, you see, we do it in terms of Mach. Uh -huh. Mach 1 is the speed of sound. Now, three quarters of the speed of sound, say around 540 miles an hour, well, we call that Mach 0.75. I see. So, it looks as though sound travels through the air about as fast as anything can without causing trouble. The shock waves begin at what you call the sonic wall, the sound barrier. Yes, that's right. And beyond that speed, the air just doesn't get out of the way in a normal fashion. It, uh, it bunches up oh. into fists that can punch holes through the toughest metals, well, that can cause aircraft to disintegrate in midair. Now, we don't know all the things shock waves can do. We just know they're there. And that nice, soft stuff, the air we breathe and live in and can't do without, well, it suddenly isn't soft anymore. It becomes an enemy. Pilots had hit that sound very long before Chuck Yeager, but none had gone through. If they did get through, they didn't come back to tell the tale, and neither did their instruments. It was Captain Yeager's project now to nurse the X-1 through a series of tests until they flew through the sound wall and came back to let the engineers know what lay beyond. Why did they choose Chuck Yeager for this? Well, maybe if we find out a little about him, we'll know. Maybe we should ask him a few questions. Where are you from, Captain Yeager? Hamlin, West Virginia. I suppose you never heard of it. It's only a small town, about 850 people. I went to school there. Graduated from the Hamlin High School when I was 18. So that fall, I enlisted in the Air Force. I started out as a mechanic, but after a while, they sent me out to a flying school in California and made me into a pilot. Guess that's all there is to it. That's all there was to it, he says. Well, he was transferred to Victorville, California, where he met a pretty, dark-haired girl named Glennis Dickhouse. Chuck Yeager received his wings in March of 1943. There was a dance afterwards, and Flight Officer Yeager was there with his girl. Let's go outside a minute, Glennis. All right, if you want. You know, uh... This can't come as any surprise to you. I love you. I know. Ever since I first met you. First I looked and thought, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I thought, isn't she pretty? And then I thought, I'd like to meet her. And I did. And it was you. I knew you were thinking something like that. I knew you were looking at me. You had a sunburn, and your eyes were so blue and honest, and you looked, well, I don't know, a little shy and frightened, so that I wanted to comfort you. But at the same time, you looked very competent, as though you knew just what you were doing were able to take care of yourself. And I think I figured you could take care of me, too. I'd like to. Will you marry me? Oh, you don't have to ask. You know my answer. Oh, there are so many things we have to do. I want you to meet my family, want them to meet you. And I wish I didn't have to go away, but I'll be back. I'll be waiting. I'll name my planes for you. <laughs> Glennis? Won't it look odd? Oh, not just Glennis. Beautiful Glennis. No, uh, glorious Glennis. <laughs> no, wait a minute, I've got it. Glamorous Glennis, that's you. Oh, they'd better treat you nicely, these glamorous Glennises, and bring you back to me or I'll... 
I'll disown them. <laughs> they will. I'll be back. <laughs> It was wartime. All over the country, young lovers were being parted. Flight Officer Charles Yeager was assigned to the 363rd Fighter Squadron of the 357th Fighter Group and sent first to Tonopah, Nevada, and then at the end of 1943, to England. Chuck Yeager made quite a record for himself. He was shot down over occupied France, escaped with the help of the French resistance forces to Spain, walked through that country until he reached Gibraltar and the RAF flowing back to England. By the end of the war, he had flown 64 missions down to 13 German planes. He was Captain Jaeger by then and the holder of the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Bronze Star Medal, the Air Medal, and the Purple Heart, and enough oak leaf clusters to start a forest. Captain Jaeger went home then to marry his Glenis. He continued flying, first at Perrin Field in Texas, and then at the Fighter Flight Test Branch at Wright Air Force Base, Ohio, outside of Dayton. That's where he met Colonel Boyd, and where Colonel Boyd and Captain Ridley started talking to him about the X-1. Chuck Yeager went home and talked it over with Glenis. You know, you've been here at Wright almost two years now. Yes? Uh, Colonel Boyd is running the show out at Edwards in California, He'd like me to go with him. You want to? What would the work be? Well, it won't be a desk job, honey. It'll be a long time before I become a chairborne flyer. I hope. You'd like me to get into something else, wouldn't you? I would never ask you to. If I were to tell you that I didn't worry every time you went up, I'd be telling a lie. But I worried about you so much during the war, and then when you were missing... But I came back. Well, that's what I keep telling myself. And you were a flyer when I met you and when I said I'd marry you. And I sort of like you, you know, just the way you are. Well, it's a good thing for you that you do, because I'm the stubborn type and I don't change easily. And I wouldn't give you up, so looks as though you are stuck with me. A terrible fate, but I'll try to bear up. All right, then bear up under the rest of your fate. We're going back to California. Edwards Air Force Base? Muroc Lake? That's us. Special Flight Test Command. Like it? Oh, I'll be glad to get back to California, but why Muroc Lake? I lived in Northern California all my life and never heard of Muroc Lake until I married the Air Force. Well, Muroc's not really what you call Northern California. It's about 70 miles inland from Los Angeles in the Mojave Desert. And it's about the best landing field in the world. A lake? Mm-hmm. Well, what have they got in it? The world's largest flat top? <laughs> well, it would have a hard time moving. Because Muroc Lake is a dried lake. Completely level. Completely flat. With the mud baked out hard. 11 miles long four miles wide. The whole thing like a huge runway. And what goes on at Muroc? Oh, shh. Oh, secret. Yes, some of it. That's where we test planes. New planes and new designs. You've got room to make a mistake in landing or taking off on the big lake. You can come down fast and roll for miles. They get planes from all over the country. And they're getting us. But what will you be doing there? Testing, dear. Testing. I shall be... Quote, one of those anonymous flyers whose names are never known, but without whom aviation progress could not continue, unquote. Oh. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I may get a chance to, to be the first person to do something, start something new, change the way people live. <laughs> You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Flight Through Sound. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. College men, you can learn to fly the latest and fastest jets easily and safely as an Air Force aviation cadet. Aviation cadets get 18 months of tough, concentrated jet training, leading to a lieutenant's commission in the Air Force and earnings of more than $5,000 a year. Your future is unlimited. To qualify, you must be between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single, and have at least two years of college. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station now. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Flight Through Sound.
Captain Yeager and his wife, Glennis, and Donald, age two, Michael, one, moved to Muroc Lake. Captain Yeager has flown the X-1 often, testing its performance. It's the middle of October, 1947. There she is, Glenn. The X-1, my project. That plane? <laughs> what did you expect, the flying boxcar? Well, most of the fighter planes are larger than this. Well, sure, but they have to be. This was built for just one purpose, to carry me and a lot of equipment. I don't know what I really expected to see, but not this. What makes this one so special? What makes it go so fast? Well, as you can see, there are no propellers, no air scoops for jets. It's rockets. Rockets powerful enough to someday send us to the moon. Uh, hey, hmm? they're pulling it away, your plane. While we're standing here with our teeth in our mouth, a, a tractor is pulling your plane away. Uh. Hi, Glenis. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Jack. Well, we're all set, Chuck. How about you? Anytime. Where's Cardenas? Back there, checking over his B-29. That won't take long. You better check in. I picked up your assignment cards. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. No change in the assignment. Just the things we lined up, hmm? That's right. Short one this time. Okay, bye, Glenn. Oh, bye. Why don't you stick around, Glennis, and watch the test? Think I can stand it? Oh, sure. Sure, this is pure routine. Just checking some adjustments we made. Then maybe I will. Good. You stay right here and make yourself comfortable. Maybe I can explain to you what's going on while you're watching. <laughs> Although you probably know as much about what goes on as I do. <laughs> From Chuck? Are you kidding? Well, she's taking off now. Seems to be 29 over there. Where? Oh, I... Ah, they're airborne now. See? All I see is one plane. I... Oh! Uh-huh. That's right. There's the X-1 nestled under the superfort like a little... Well, I don't know, bird or something. It's a piggyback ride in reverse. But how does this help? Oh, I, I mean, if it can go so fast, why does it need a, a, a mother plane to pick it up? Well, you see, it takes more effort to get the ship in the air to overcome the initial inertia. It would use up a certain amount of the X-1's limited fuel supply to get her off the ground, to get her moving. Mm. She's due to drop any minute. Drop? Well, you know, leave the B-29 and fly on her own. Watch. Uh. Oh, th there it goes. Look, the B-29's going backwards. No, no, that's just the way it looks. You see, it's just that the, the X-1 shoots away so fast. Well, do you see what I'm getting at? I think I'm getting the idea. But, Jack, what really does happen at the speed of sound? Well, you want to know something? We don't really know. Your husband probably knows as much about that as any man alive. But we, we don't know, but we're coming closer to it every day. And one of these days we'll find out. <laughs> Glennis didn't know it, but she saw a semi-historic flight, the last test flight of the X-1 before the big one. The next day, when Captain Yeager left his pleasant little desert house, he may have taken an extra long look at the kids when Glennis wasn't noticing. When he got to the base and went into Colonel Boyd's office, there was no sense in pretending that it was just another test. This was the day, the big one. Major Cardenas greeted him as he comes in. How are you feeling, Chuck? Get stiff. Ah, now, now stop the kidding, boys. You're going to do something today that no man's ever done before. You're smart enough to know what that means. The thing is, I'm curious enough to want to find out what happens. Good, good, as long as you feel that way. Now, the main thing is, don't take any unnecessary chances. If everything doesn't seem just right, don't do it. I mean, we'd rather have you come back without getting up to Mach 1 than have you go as fast as sound and, well, and not get back. Don't worry. I'll be back, all right. <laughs> It's October 14, 1947, a date that has gone down in aviation history. There goes the mothership carrying the X-1. Major Cardenas is in command of the B-29, number 800. He will take the X-1 aloft, talk with Captain Yeager on the radio, and tell him when to drop after the B-29 has attained the right altitude and speed. Then Major Cardenas' task is finished, and it's up to Captain Yeager. There go the only other craft that will be in the sky at the time, the two F-80 chase planes that will observe the behavior of the X-1 when she makes her pass at the unknown, the flight through sound. We're up about 7,000 feet now. Captain Yeager gets into the X-1 through a little side door. He spends the next few minutes getting himself set, putting on his oxygen mask, 
checking all the controls, looking over the instruments, while Major Cardenas takes the two planes up higher and higher. He looks through a narrow windshield, a small window made not of plastic, but of glass. Friction with the air might melt a plastic. Captain Yeager sits there, able to hear the engines of the B-29 that are carrying him and his X-1 like an eagle with a rabbit in its claws, waiting for word from Major Cardenas. I'm turning on downwind leg at 21,000 feet. Can you hear me? Roger. You all right? Fine. Except I'm scared stiff. <laughs> you always say that. Always am. Sure. So we'll think you're a hero or something. Nuts. <laughs> I'm turning on the base leg. Five minutes of drop time. Five minutes. Four minutes. Three minutes. To what? Nobody knows. To hit against the sound barrier? To shake to pieces? To find that sound puts up a wall that can't be broken through or climbed or detoured? Another hundred beats of the heart. And then what? Air Force 800 to NACA radar Edwards Tower. F-80 chase aircraft. One minute warning. Pilot to Jaeger. 30 seconds to drop time. Start your recording instruments at 15. I always do. I know, but I'm supposed to remind you. Hit all the numbers this time when you count. You always forget one. Don't worry about the numbers. You go off when I say drop. You're at the 15 now. Start your instruments. They're started. 15 seconds to the unknown. 15 seconds, and each one is an eternity. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 3, 2, 1, drop. Dropping clear. Air Force 800 at exactly 1412, X1, drop clear. X1 to Muroc Tower. We're starting down. First rocket. Feels like someone hitting me, shoving me back. It picks up speed so fast. Initial acceleration, tremendous. It's Mach 0.6. Using second rocket. Mach 0.7, still accelerating rapidly. Mach 0.8. Not picking up speed so fast. Using third rocket. Mark point nine. Beginning to get shock waves. Still in full control. Mark point nine four. Nine five. Using last rocket. This is it. Mark point nine seven. Taking worse. Response to controls. Unevenly. Point nine eight. Point nine nine. We're going to make it. Mach 1. We made it. Mach 1. Faster now. Mach 1.1. 1.2. We did it. Vibration is all gone. So is sound. Running like a baby carriage going downhill. No sound. No vibration. Beyond Mach 1, everything is quiet. Easy. It's like a dream. No vibration. No shock waves. No sound. And then the little orange speedster began to slow down. Slow down, what a thing to say. Slow down to 600 miles an hour. It's used up its rockets. Its power is gone. It's performed its function. And Charles Jaeger, the first man to fly faster than sound, is performing common everyday tasks using compressed nitrogen to flush out any remainder of the dangerous locks and alcohol from his plane's propulsion system. And he gets his speed down to a reasonable 165 miles an hour and lands on the hard, dried mud of Muroc Lake. To be greeted by flashbulbs and reporters and radio men? No. By Colonel Boyd and Captain Ridley... And secrecy. Well, how'd it go? You ought to know. Just the way you planned it. Just the way you said it would. You want to do it again? Anytime. This, now we've done it once, is only the beginning. You mean it? You'll go up again and do it? Tomorrow. Now that we know we can. There are a lot of things we have to find out about supersonics. In fact, there's almost everything to be found out. It's a whole new world up there. 
And that was the first flight through sound. Man, earthbound, spacebound man had done it again and opened a new door to the future. That was October 14, 1947. That flight earned Captain, now Major Yeager, the Collier Trophy and the Mackay Trophy for outstanding service to aviation. What's Major Yeager doing now? He's testing highly classified aircraft only one step removed from the designer's drawing boards and seemingly only another step from some of the craft described in science fiction. Some of these planes are perhaps as far ahead of their time as the X-1 was when Major Yeager started a few years ago. As he puts it, we punched so many holes in the sonic wall, you can still see them all over the Mojave Desert. And where's the X-1, the plane that first flew faster than sound? The X-1 is at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. A stubby little orange-colored plane on exhibition with other planes that made history, Wrights and Langley's and Lindbergh's and others. And the man who made the history? Well, he's still making it for the United States Air Force. <laughs> Proudly we hail Major Charles E. Yeager, the first man to fly faster than sound, who enlisted in the Air Force as a private less than 12 years ago. And proudly we hail all the airmen whose work and devotion to duty made the Major's historic flight possible. Young man, if you've had two years of college, are single and otherwise qualified, there's a future for you as an aviation cadet in the U.S. Air Force. You'll receive 18 months of the world's finest flight training, fly the latest jets easily and safely, and graduate as an Air Force lieutenant with earnings of more than $5,000 a year. The aviation cadets of today will be the leaders of the jet age. Be one of them. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>